So the uh, next speaker is Stephanie Smith, and she's going to talk on acute invasive fungal sinusitis. All right, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Um, I somehow missed the memo asking me to talk about who I am and my career path, so I'll improvise a little here. And I'll begin by saying I'm, the, um, I'm an otolaryngologist. I think I'm a lone wolf here at this meeting, but I've really enjoyed um, the meeting so far, so thank you for um, just kind of your welcoming um, spirit. It's been a lot of fun and very educational. Um, so I'm at Northwestern University. I'm an assistant professor, um, and I'm a surgeon scientist. So um, I study uh, acute sinusitis with a new kind of developing interest in the invasive fungal uh, type. I'm a member of the Northwestern University Sinus Center, which is just a fabulous collaborative um, group of investigators and clinicians, uh, multidisciplinary, kind of under the guidance of Bob Schleimer, who you may know. Um, we have big translational research there. We have a, a biorepository of 4,000 sinusitis specimens um, and 1,000 non-sinusitis controls from which we've been able to study a lot of the endotypes and kind of pathophysiology of sinusitis, which is really exciting. Um, in addition to my clinical practice, I do direct uh, quality improvement, and I'm the associate residency program director for our department. And um, I'm the research chair for the American Rhinologic Society Women in Rhinology section. So that's our big kind of rhinologic society with about 1,000 members. In terms of my career path, um, after my residency at Northwestern, I stayed on to do a fellowship um, in health services and outcomes research in a T32 program. Um, where I uh, learned kind of some of those big data uh, techniques that Dr. McGinn was talking about. Um, and then as faculty, I uh, did a K-12 in patient centers outcomes research with a focus on acute sinusitis. Uh, next, I was asked to talk about what excites me and challenges me in research, and so I will queue up my slides here. All right, so acute invasive fungal sinusitis, for the purpose of background, if you're not aware, is this very rare but um, aggressive and often fatal disease um, of fungal invasion that occurs in the nose and paranasal sinuses. It occurs when we inhale fungal hyphae and they invade and cause this thrombosis and angioinvasion, and then this kind of rapidly progressive tissue necrosis. Over hours to days, it can spread to the eyes and brain and can be very kind of tragic. The most common organisms are rhizopus, mucor, and aspergillus. Uh, previous presenters have kind of gone through some of the pathogenesis that is shared with most invasive fungal diseases, um, but suffice it to say that we really don't understand why this affects the poor, uh, very poor and few unlucky uh, people. AFS epidemiologic data are very scarce. One study out of Taiwan found about two per 1,000 people in the hospital with hematologic diseases uh, developed acute invasive fungal sinusitis. Some studies show that the incidence of mucormycosis has doubled over the past two decades in international series. Um, but there's one US study um, that showed no real clear change in incidence of mucor here. But there are increases demonstrated in other studies. Outbreaks, as we've discussed, have been linked to things like contaminated linens, but also natural disasters, um, construction, even negative pressure rooms, and things that we think are clean in our hospital. What's very kind of impressive and pressing is that we do have some data about the epidemiology of uh, invasive mucormycosis in India during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there were reports um, of more than about 50,000 cases occurring in India over about a three-month period in June of 2021. And I'm thankful for the MSG for kind of organizing a Twitter forum where I got to talk to some surgeons in India who were doing like 10 cases a day, whereas we see about 10 cases a year in most U.S. academic medical centers, just for reference. So this led me to kind of really want to study the epidemiology in the United States, and nothing has been published from a national level. So last year, um, I looked at the nationwide inpatient sample um, and, and looked at the 2018 data. So pre-pandemic -pre data was the latest I could get. And there were about under just shy of 500 cases. We did find that actually non-white patients were disproportionately affected for unclear reasons. 
Uh, the, the lower half of median household income was slightly higher uh, affected. And interestingly, the majority of cases, 56% occurred in the South. So this is kind of news um, in my field um, and very interesting. Um, I also look at the fungal organisms, which I didn't highlight here, but mucor accounted for 46% of cases and aspergillus, 32%. The outcomes of acute invasive fungal sinusitis are pretty dire. Um, most, uh, our systematic review estimates about a 50% mortality rate. In my study, there was about a 24% mortality rate. Now, I'll talk about the treatment briefly. It is a three-pronged approach, number one being systemic antifungal therapy that's initiated as soon as we uh, suspect this. We try to reverse the underlying, underlying immunocompromised state, if at all possible. And then one of the mainstays of treatment is rapid surgical debridement. Um, what we do is we go in and we kind of just start debriding, removing whatever tissue is necrotic and looks affected, the theory being that we're reducing the fungal burden. Now, rhinectomy, or removing the external nose, maxillectomy, removing the, the facial bones and the cheek, um, craniotomy, or removing an eye, orbital exoneration are considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And a recent system, or a 2013 systematic review showed that orbital exoneration may not improve survival, but there's a lot of selection bias there of these very advanced cases presenting with disease in the brain or the eye already. Um, more recently, some small series and a small systematic review suggested that vision sparing modalities like retrobulbar injection of AMFO um, may confer good survival outcomes. So um, for this audience, I'm gonna present just some surgical cases highlighting the diagnostic and therapeutic kind of challenges that I face in this case. Here, um, I'm debriding the face of the sphenoid sinus um, with a forceps that's kind of like a glorified nail clipper, I would say. That's the, the second view here after debriding the face of the sphenoid sinus. And just to, to show you kind of where the anatomy is, we have the optic nerve and the carotid artery right here, millimeters away from where we're debriding. And so there is a limitations to what surgery can do. Um, so that's, these are kind of the cases that make you a little bit worked up at times. Uh, this is a case just from last week of a 30-something-year-old with AIDS who presented with just acute sinusitis symptoms and was calling her um, outpatient ID physician about it and then sent in this picture and the ID physician said, why don't you come into the ER? Um, here we see some frank necrosis of the lateral nasal ala and then this crust here. So I was very concerned for AFS. Can I play a video? Oh, here we go. So this is an operative video um, going into the nose. And generally in AFS, we take biopsy. So in the ER, I took a biopsy. It showed necrosis, no, but no fungal organisms. So here, I'm taking a biopsy of the middle turbinate. It's not really bleeding like you would expect vital tissue to bleed. And that's the inferior turbinate there that's really congested um, and not bleeding like you'd expect by pulling out a piece of tissue from the nose. Um, And so far, my four intraoperative biopsies showed necrosis, but no fungal organism. So, so it's a diagnostic and therapeutic dilemma. What am I to do? Should I remove part of this woman's, 30-year-old woman's nose that would ultimately scar down and be very disfiguring, or wait and see with the thought that, wow, if I wait and see, is that going to threaten her, her life? Um, what's interesting is that this turned out to be, I'm um, sorry, that case turned out to be um, a very rare case of necrotizing pseudomonas. So she's doing well, but very interesting. There's only kind of very few case reports of that. Um, here's a publication um, from a few months ago, um, kind of an interesting case. This is a patient with a plastic anemia on entrobabagate bag, I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that one, as well as tacrolim, tacro. Um, and he was also on prophylactic voriconazole, but presented with neutropenic fevers. And that was a kind of bedside nasal endoscopy view where there's a crust on the middle turbinate. It's not that impressive. I'm sure you've blown your nose and had something come out that looks like that at some point. Um, but my residents called me and while I was walking over to see this patient, they biopsied that crust as well as the underlying mucosa. 
What's interesting is the crust showed fungal organisms, which isn't that, unu that unusual. Um, a lot of us have probably some fungal species in our nasal mucus. Um, but just out of concern for this patient, we went to the operating room and took some biopsies. Um, the intraoperative biopsies did not show any fungus, but the final pathology results six days later did show these superficially invasive um, fungal organisms um, that eventually grew, up, grew out as alternaria. So it was perplexing. I took him back to the operating room after we got that final path six days later. Things looked healthy and viable, and he ultimately did well. Um, so that's kind of summarize some of the surgical challenges and I think opportunities for diagnosis and treatment improve, improvements. I'm getting my zero time remaining here, but um, future directions, I do want to look better at the epidemiology and prognostic factors, kind of national level, large scale of AFS, and um, we're working to build a multi-center um, AFS patient registry and biorepository and look forward to talking to some of you about your experience with those biorepositories. Bio Thank you.